Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. Uh, my name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Robert Wolf. And welcome, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last week, if if you were watching these in sequence, I interviewed uh, Robert's friend Natalie Gray. And uh, did you get a chance to watch that by any ch chance, Robert? I haven't yet, but I will. Okay, no I problem. Just wondering what you thought of it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, one thing that people asked after the Natalie interview, uh, Natalie said that when she s first sat with you, you asked her three questions, mm -hmm. and she had an awakening as uh, as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And I neglected to ask what the three questions are, and everybody's been sending in emails saying, all right, what are the three questions? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I <coughs> it wasn't a three questions that are like... Uh, pre-programmed exactly uh -huh. um, and it might be a bit of an exaggeration to say that that was her awakening I, I have a feeling from the time that I met Natalie that uh, she was pretty well uh, prepared to uh, thoroughly understand what we were going to be talking about uh -huh. uh, but in any case uh, I did ask some things um, and I don't remember what the three questions were. Can I ask her? Uh, sure. Go ahead. Natalie, Natalie, what were the three questions? If you're enlightened, what is that? If you're enlightened, what is that? Is that a question? Yeah. Okay. If you're not enlightened, what is that? If you're not enlightened, what is that? And if that's the absolute both times, what's the difference? If that's the absolute both times, what's the difference? Huh. Could you elaborate on what you meant by those three questions? <coughs> what was the first question? If you're enlightened, what is that? What is it that's enlightened? Oh, in other words, yeah, when we say someone's enlightened, what do we mean by that? Okay, that's a good place to start, actually. And if we say they're not enlightened, what do we mean by that? Uh-huh. And therefore, where's the difference in, in, our, in our perception of that? Right. So, um... How would you answer those questions? Well, you know, from the classical point of view, in other words, a traditional point of view, mm -hmm. it's said that there's no such thing as enlightenment. Right. Um, and the second question, tell me that one again. Um, if you're not enlightened, mm -hmm. what, what is that? Okay. So, so the other thing is that... Uh, People assume that there's something in enlightenment that is uh, radically different from their present, current uh -huh. state of being. Yeah. Uh, so basically, those are the two questions, and the, the question is, what what is there between that that's creating a a problem? Ah, huh. so are you saying that because people assume that enlightenment is radically different than what they're experiencing already, that they always sort of overlook it because they're expecting something radically different. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Now, of course, some people do report pretty radical shifts. Mm -hmm. um, do you suppose it depends upon kind of whether they have sort of gradually built up to the precipice of that? Like in, the, in Natalie's case, you said she f was quite prepared. Whereas someone else, you know, they might be in a, some deep depression or muddled state, and for some reason they auto automatically snap into it, and it's like this night and day difference? Well, you know, I, I, I think there's a bit of mythology, you might say, in the spiritual uh, material, the spiritual literature. Um, and what people get from that is uh, sometimes an exaggerated idea of what enlightenment entails. Mm -hmm. um, and so comparisons are made between the experience that one is actually having and the conception that one, someone has of what ought to be happening, mm -hmm. what they think is the state that they should be feeling. Right. And of course the enlightened point of view is that whatever you're feeling is, is that. Yeah. 
But to me, that's like saying whatever you're looking at is atoms. I look at this piece of paper, it's nothing but atoms. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean I see it as atoms. You know, I don't have the electron microscope or whatever that would enable me to see it as atoms. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you could say all 7 billion people in the world, and not only people, but cats and dogs and everything else, they're, whatever they're seeing, it's that. But it, isn't it another matter altogether for them to realize that it's that, mm -hmm. to really truly awaken to that? Yes, and that basically is, is all that it's about, just that, just uh, recognizing that what we're seeing is what's actually to be seen, that there's nothing more mysterious about what's present than, than what we're seeing, mm -hmm. recognizing that we're seeing the truth. And what would you consider to be the key to that recognition? Well, there's two things that I emphasize in my discussions with people. And the first thing is that it's very important for a person to recognize that this that we're talking about, this uh, essence, uh, must be here now. Yes. Can't be any other place. It must be here now. Mm -hmm. So there's no separation to start with. It's clear that you're not apart from what you're looking for when you realize that the truth is it must be here now. It can't be some other place from the standpoint of what these teachings are telling us. Then the second thing is, is that when that becomes clear, when it becomes clear that this and that are in no way separate, that there's no disconnection between the, those two things, then what develops in time as one uh, integrates that awareness is that the sense of being a separate individual dissolves into that awareness. So those are the two things I think that are most important for people to recognize in, in these discussions that, that I have with people is that, first of all, what you're looking for is here now. Secondly, there is no separate individual. Why would you say that it takes time as opposed to someone just sort of having the recognition right here now or they, you know, hearing you say that and saying, okay, great, everything, you know, that's here now, I mean, that this is it and I must be done because I'm just accepting that notion. Well, you might say the question there would be who's accepting it. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the idea we have is that there's some separate individual here who's going to get something that's out there, that's separate and apart. And again, the thing that, that I particularly emphasize is that there's no separation, no division whatsoever. So there's not a me here that's going to get something out there. The mm -hmm. me and that are not, not separate to begin with. Um, but could there be a distinction between understanding that intellectually or even having an intuitive feel for it and then really living it? Uh, the title of your book is Living Non-Duality. Non mm -hmm. That's right. Yes. Uh, you know, people often say, I have an intellectual understanding of this and that's all that I have. And, you know, you have to start somewhere. So an intellectual understanding is, is a suitable place to start. Mm -hmm. uh, if this truth really makes sense to you, to the extent that the idea of being someone separate, an individual, dissolves into that awareness, then that's all there is to it. That's li from then on, you're living non-duality. So what you just said was, if this really makes sense to you, then to the extent that this individual conception dissol uh, dissolves into, <laughs> I, I'm losing your, your exact words, mm -hmm. then, then you're living non-duality. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it sounds to me like the word if is very um, significant mm -hmm. there, because there could be a great range of, of meanings in the phrase, if this really makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there are a lot of people kicking around these days who read a book like yours or li go to a so song or something, and, and they, what they hear makes sense, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, but they kind of jump to the conclusion of, well, that's it. This makes sense to me. Therefore, I am 
kind of living it now. And I, I hate to be you know, so skeptical sounding, but I, I'm afraid I am, and I bring this point up in a lot of interviews. And I'm, I'm not you know, qualified to judge any particular individual's experience by any means, but I just get the feeling that there's a lot of substitution of intellectual understanding for the actual living of non-duality. There could be a, a much deeper, richer, fuller, more genuine experience than uh, a lot of people are having, and a lot of people are kind of missing that boat because they think they've already, they're already, they've already got it. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. agree? Uh, is that am well? I, is uh, again, Rick, uh, when the, when the truth of this is truly understood, yeah, and the idea of being a separate self dissolves into that. Then that's all we're talking about. Yeah. And and so there, you know, obviously there there are people to whom this truth does not penetrate to the point to which the b idea of being s a separate individual mm -hmm. disappears. It doesn't happen that way for everyone. That's true. Right. Now, in your own case, of course, um, you lived the better part of your life without that understanding and that's experience. That's true. Yeah. It, and um, and perhaps we could actually retrace a little bit here and get into a, a biographical sketch. But you, you know, you as I recall, you you went through a divorce and then you went off and lived in the in the forest for a, a few years in a trailer and mm -hmm. took nice walks every day and did a lot of reading and meditating and whatnot. And then then the truth dawned to you. Could, mm -hmm. um, could could you elaborate a bit on all on that whole sequence of events? Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll give you a, a little more background than maybe you might have gotten from the book. Uh -huh. In fact, I could start at the beginning if you want. If you have Please, time. yes, yes, absolutely. Well, uh, I was born in Ohio, and my mother was what I would call a congenital Baptist. <laughs> and my father said that he was an atheist, uh, so obviously they didn't get along too well. And uh, I was raised primarily by my mother, so I went to church with my mother and uh, was baptized when I was 13. And uh, by the time I became 20, uh, I became an atheist, uh, seeing the uh, hypocrisy in the church. Uh, and when I was about in my 30s, uh, working as a reporter in Manhattan, uh, there were a number of Zen Roshis, this was in the 60s, mm. coming over from Japan to open centers in the U.S. And they'd usually stop in Manhattan and give a talk before they went inland. Mm -hmm. So as a reporter, I covered some of those talks and was very impressive with, uh, impressed with the, uh, not only the persons, but uh, with what they had to say. So I read Alan Watts's uh, Way of Zen, and uh, I was, impressed with Zen because it seemed to me like it was a religion that wanted to put itself out of business. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so about that same time, my uh, career came to an end in, in New York, and uh, I uh, decided I would come out to California, and uh, I landed in Berkeley and uh, stayed with a friend there for a while, and I went down to the university campus and asked around if there was a Zen farming commune, because being from Ohio, I kind of wanted to return to my roots. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody told me about a place in Mendocino, which is about 150 miles north of uh, San Francisco, uh, which this place isn't in existence anymore, uh, a place called at that time Big River Farm, which uh, was just outside of Mendocino. and. Uh, so I took a bus up there and uh, liked what I saw and uh, became a member of the uh, community there. There was uh, about uh, maybe a dozen of us uh, young people, no children, uh, living in a... Uh, there was a man who had... Um, am I going... No, you're doing fine. That's okay. Great. There was a man who had uh, been teaching uh, English to uh, inmates uh, in that area and uh, he uh, met uh, the daughter of uh, uh, some wealthy oil people and married her, and they bought this uh, old farm on a hillside there outside Mendocino, and he tore down all the buildings 
uh, and using Japanese tools, rebuilt them all in a Japanese village style. Uh, he had been to San Francisco Zen Center and was very impressed with, with the Japanese part of Buddhism. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we lived in this uh, commune. We had no teacher. We were using uh, Suzuki Roshi's uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind as our text. Uh, sitting meditation two periods a day, um, two periods in the morning, two periods in the evening. Uh, anyway, I lived there for about three years at the Zen farming commune and uh, got about all I could get out of the Zen teachings. Uh, so I moved into the town of Mendocino. We'd had a organic garden and orchard there at the uh, farm. So when I moved into Mendocino, I started a landscape gardening business. And um, after about six years of that, I met my second wife, who was a school teacher. And uh, we married, and my mother gave me some money, and we I had a house built. And um, because uh, there's about 38 inches of rain in Mendocino in the three months of winter, um, I uh, was out of work uh, a good part of the winter, which uh, didn't satisfy my wife too much because she had a steady job. Mm. So uh, uh, I quit that work and uh, became uh, an agent for an insurance company, uh, which had a financial planning uh, practice uh, that I had in in the nearby town. Uh, anyway, after about 10 years of that life, uh, my wife decided she wanted to be free again, and so we separated and divorced. And I bought a uh, camper van with uh, the equity from uh, when we sold our house and moved out onto some property in the Redwood Forest of some friends. And I realized, uh, Rick, that I uh, had some unfinished business that uh, while I had been very interested in what Zen had to teach, that I hadn't really gotten to the bottom of what, what these teachings were telling me. So I went to the bookstore. Again, am I going on too long with this? No, this is fine. If I feel like we're la you know, dragging, I'll ask you a question, but this is good. Okay. Uh, so I went to the bookstore, and uh, you know, at that time, in, in a bookstore, there was maybe oh, two or a couple of feet of, uh, of books that had to do with enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Now you go into a the bookstore, there's a whole wing of such books. Right. This whole bookstore is about it. That's right. So I, so I bought you know, some books on enlightenment. And um, I, uh, there was one book that had interviews with various teachers. One interview was with Krishnamurti. And the preface to the interview talked about how he had dissolved the order of the star. And that impressed me. Um, so I called down here to Ojai to the Krishnamurti Foundation and asked what books I might read about him. And I read his three-volume biography in which uh, there are much of his teachings. So that was what I was doing during that three-year period in the forest. I was reading, at that time, primarily Krishnamurti, but I was also reading some of uh, Ken Wilber's writings and also Fritjof Capper's <coughs> Tao of Physics. Right. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, as you mentioned, I was uh, living in a camper van, uh, reading, contemplating, taking long, long walks. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of a, in this case, three-year period, everything suddenly fell into place. Mm. So how much can you elaborate on that suddenly fell into place? Oh. Um, what, what can you say about that? I, I can say some things about it. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, because I had a camper van, I was doing house sitting, and uh, so I was at, at someone's house uh, sitting near the fireplace uh, one evening, probably reading Krishnamurti, but in any case, I, I had been taking a lot of uh, notes during that period. I'd wake up at night and sometimes write something down. Uh, so I got up and I went to the typewriter and I put a sheet of paper in and uh, typed out a page. And when I read it back, I realized that, uh, that I knew what it was that I was wanting to know. Mm -hmm. uh, this wasn't 
coming from someplace else. It was coming from here that right. had written this out, and, and so I was clear that, that, yes, okay, this tells me that I know what I want to know. Mm -hmm. so, so that basically was, was the moment when I uh, realized that uh, the seeking was ended. Huh. And it sounds like uh, it wasn't the night and day difference, as you were saying earlier, people are expecting something flashy. It sounds right. like it was a kind of a subtle shift in exactly. confidence or understanding or something. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah, the, again, as I say, part of the mythology uh, that's, that's growing up around enlightenment is that, um, you know, that there's going to be this uh, explosive thing, uh, all kinds of uh, bizarre things uh, going on and so on and so forth. But, you know, yeah. different people, it's a different, different unfolding. And so for some people, it's very quiet and subdued. You know, some people just say, uh-huh, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not... It's it, it, in all fairness, it, it's good to well. You just said it. Um, it can be like almost imperceptible shift. On the other hand, it can be kind of dramatic, but it doesn't have to be one way or the other. Exactly. And, and if you're expecting it to show up in a particular way, you know, and it doesn't, you could always be disappointed. That people are often disappointed. In other words, that they say, "This is what I realize," but it's not like uh, Muktananda's, you know, awakening. So it must yeah. not be real. Yeah. I was talking to someone just the other day who watches these interviews. I ran into her, and um, she was kind of going on about, well, this person couldn't be enlightened because she's, mm -hmm. she sells beef jerky for a living, and this, yeah, person, right. this person couldn't be enlightened because um, she, you know, he eats hamburgers. And it's like, and, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. we, there was this whole structure they built up about how it had to look on the outside and exactly. what, what, what kind of behavior the person had to perform or That's else they right. couldn't, couldn't meet her criteria. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yep. You know, uh, the idea is if you're not wearing some kind of robes, speaking some kind of, uh, with an accent, uh, and have some kind of strange name or something, you can't be enlightened. Yeah, as a matter of fact, about half an hour ago, um, somebody, I re read an email that somebody sent me. They, they linked me to a YouTube video, and they said, this is what enlightenment looks like. And it was an interview of a, a swami walking back and forth, waving a fan over his mm -hmm. disciples. And, uh, and I've heard of the guy, and he has a very good reputation. I'm sure he was a highly enlightened man. But she said, it, but I emailed back and said, well, you know, it, it may show up in a business suit. It doesn't necessarily have to look like that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, now that you mentioned that, Papaji said when he went around India looking for teachers, he actually did see the ones in robes, and he said they were just uh, gurus in business suits, <laughs> <laughs> meaning that <laughs> that was what their interest was, was a business. Yeah, businessmen in guru suits. That's right. Um, could also be. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, how long ago was that when you had that awakening, you were living in the camper, and... Well, I, I'm not a good person for keeping track of time, but... Uh, I mean, a decade ago, 20, it was uh, like 20 years ago, right? Yeah, yeah, by my calculations, I would say maybe 20, 22 years or so now. Yeah. Um, I always ask this of people, and to the point where some people are sick of me asking it, but others say they like to hear different people s answer the same question. Sure. But, um, you know, since that time, uh, do you... Do you feel there's been a, an ongoing kind of maturation or deepening mm -hmm. or clarification? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and could you elaborate on that if so? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think the thing is that um, uh, every day there's something kind of new to be seen. In other words, uh, there's a continual unfolding uh, of appreciation, you might say, uh, seeing things again in a new light. In fact, that's one of the first things you notice uh, after uh, an awakening is that uh, you begin to uh, see the things you've seen before, but you notice that you're seeing them in a different light, a different perspective. And, and that, that continues. Things continue to unfold and continue to be seen uh, in their significance. Um, and then, too, you know, in my own case, and my own case is probably different than that of many people, but in my case, there probably hasn't been a day uh, since that awakening that I haven't either read about, spoken about, or written about this matter. Mm -hmm. So for me, there's always a sharp edge on this awareness because I'm, I'm never far from, from being uh, immersed in it. 
Um, so I think that has uh, something to do with uh, whatever effectiveness I have in, in transmitting these teachings is that uh, that I've uh, uh, you know I've, I've read a lot of what's out there yeah and and I talk to people constantly about this matter and I write about it regularly so yeah. so I think that that helps me to develop an effectiveness I think it does and and as a matter of fact uh you know, some people buy books because I recommend them on this show. I, I, I recommend this one. It's very good. It's your book, uh, Living Non-Duality, which I'll have a link to on, on my website when we put this up. Uh, but I, I, unfortunately, with the time constraints in my life, I haven't gotten too far into it. Oh, yeah. I've, I, it's 450 pages, but yeah, right. I, I, I really do enjoy it. It's very clearly written, and uh, it's the kind of book where you can just kind of settle in and read a paragraph or two or a page or two. And, yeah. And, it has a kind of a nice um, refining influence on one's yeah. awareness. Yeah, well, there's 230 monographs in there, and, and people uh, tell me that often the way they read it is just kind of open it to something and, and read one of the monographs because they're all pretty short. Yeah. But um, you're the first media to know that uh, I've got a third book uh, coming out in about two weeks, um, and I think you'll like this one too. It's 145 pages, which is uh, about a third of the size of Living Non-Duality. Uh -huh. And uh, I think it has most all of the uh, essence of what's uh, taught in, in Living Non-Duality in, in this one brief book. Huh. Um, one Essence is the title. And uh, I just uh, heard today that it'll be, I think, uh, I think it's available as of now, I'm told, uh, and I think the cover price is $18. Uh -huh. um, so I, I think you'll find that one to be uh, worthwhile, too. Well, I'll link to it. <clears throat> so would it be fair to say, based on what you just described about you know the refinement in your ability to express this over the last couple of decades due to the fact that you've had your attention on it every day, um, is it just icing on the cake? I mean, would you, would you say that b basically with that uh, awakening, that initial awakening or shift in understanding, that's that's the foundation of it. And anything that's happened since then has just been a kind of a <clears throat> a relative um, refinement. Yeah. I think one thing people feel uh, when they come to this truth is the desire to share it. And you see that in the lives of all the uh, all the sages. I mean, what did they do with their life? 24/7, they were available to uh, be of assistance to people who wanted their assistance. Mm -hmm. um, so there is that impulse, and there was that impulse for me immediately. Um, you know, after Buddha's awakening, uh, he went to Deer Park and looked up his five former cronies and uh, told them what uh, what he was seeing. And according to the legend, they all woke up. Uh, but anyway, after my own awakening, I uh, began to talk to some of the people I had knew who were interested in this matter. So that that instinct was there right from the beginning. Uh, but you know, it, that need not be the case. Uh, it's just that, from my own standpoint, uh, I, I like to say, and it's something I sometimes get a little flack over saying, but. I like to say that nothing really matters. So in my case, I wake up in the morning, I put my feet on the floor, and for me, nothing really matters. So how do I spend my day? Uh, all, I, all I feel like doing is basically talking about this with people or writing about it or, or somehow expressing it. Yeah. That's all f I feel like doing either, but it doesn't pay the bills, so I, I do other right. stuff for the good part of That's my day. <laughs> it doesn't pay the bills, but I'm on Social Security, so I Oh, can. there you go. <laughs> Give me a few years, I'll be there too. Right. <laughs> um, that's great. And uh, do you, aside from writing a few books, do you? Uh, I guess you give satsangs in Ojai, do you? Well, first of all, I don't. I don't like the idea of satsangs. Um, uh, when I, the reason why I came to Ojai was because you know, when that three-year period ended. Um, I no longer felt the need to be living in a cold, rainy climate. Yeah. Uh, and having a camper van, I decided I could live anywhere I wanted. So uh, I thought, well, why not live in Ojai, where Krishnamurti lived and died? And uh, maybe there's a group of people there who are familiar with his teachings, and I could relate to them. 
because yeah. there wasn't anybody where I, I was living that I could relate to in that respect. So, uh, so I came to Ohio, and indeed there was a group of about 40 people or so um, who had been influenced by Kay. Many of them have died off because they're an older group. One woman had even been there at the fireside thing in 1926 where he dissolved the Order of the Star. Wow. Um, and then I started a couple of uh, discussion groups of my own. Um, but there's some limitations to, to that sort of thing. Uh, and one of the things I discovered was, um, if you don't mind my going into all this. No, please. Okay. Yeah. One, thing, one, one thing I discovered was... Um, uh, I put some notices in some of those free handout newspapers that I was available to talk to people about non-duality one-on-one. -on -one. So people would sometimes call me and come over to my house. And I found that to be the most effective way to transmit the Dharma, to, uh, yeah. to have face-to-face, one-on-one discussions with people. Mm. Um, then when my book came out, um, one of the uh, uh, board members of the Christian Murdy Foundation read it and asked me to do something monthly. Uh, and so I started a, a discussion group, which is uh, still going on. Uh, and uh, basically, I just opened the meeting by reading something from one of the sages. And then it's an open, free discussion. I participate in the discussion, but yeah, you know, I, I'm not keen on the idea of sitting up in front of a group of people with flowers and picture of my guru and, and incense and uh, a 30 minute uh, silent meditation before anybody says a word and all that sort of stuff. Um, mm. So no, no, uh, and I don't travel, so I don't do satsangs. That's the answer to the question. No, I don't do satsangs. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, the word satsang is just sort of a handy, fra uh -huh. handy, handy word. Yeah. It doesn't, I'm yeah. not necessarily implying flowers and incense and, yeah. you know, yeah. touching your feet or anything. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it can be that. It, it can, can be that. Yeah, can be. Um, I, know, I noticed I, in, in your book at one point you said um, self-realization must be top priority. Um, it must be on top of, of the priority of egoic fulfillment. Fulfillment. Otherwise, ego fulfillment will take priority. Um, the average person, of course, is you know supporting a family mm -hmm. and, and doing all sorts of things. Um, do you feel that self-realization can become top priority in the uh, despite the pressures and distractions of of uh, ordinary life? Well, you know, my situation is a little rarefied because the people that I talk with are people who for whom this is a pretty sincere matter. In many cases, they've been looking at this for 20, 30, 40 years or so. So, you know, so it's something that uh, already is uh, a pretty, uh, you might say, serious matter as far as they're concerned. Um, but, yeah, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that's really a key element in this does have to do with the degree to which this is uh, high on your uh, agenda of matters to, to be attended to. Yeah. And would you agree that perhaps, you know, you're not implying that people should quit their jobs and desert their families, but it can somehow be made a priority even if you uh, are carrying on a load of ordinary worldly responsibilities? Well, that's true. You know, uh, Buddha did quit his uh, job as job as a prince and right. left his family uh, mm -hmm. so you know uh, in some cases that uh, may be what's uh, necessary yeah um, but you know on the other hand uh, Ramana assured people that uh, it's uh, okay to be a householder and uh, and to uh, live this life too um, the, the key really has to do with uh, how one looks at the matter of time in regard to this issue. Krishnamurti talked a lot about that. Um, the real problem associated with this is that the idea we have is that if I do this particular thing and do it right and do it long enough, then there's going to be this benefit, this fruit. And of course, that's the whole idea of any kind of practice. Any kind of practice is 
do this, do it right, do it long enough, and this is going to happen. So the effect of that is the idea that there's something in the future that's going to be present that's not present now. Mm -hmm. And this is why the teachings of non-duality, I think, are so important, because they, they de-emphasize that. They stress that what you're looking for must be here now. It's not a matter of something that's going to occur at some future point in time, mm -hmm. because all you need to do is recognize that you're not apart from what you're looking for. But of course, coming from a, a sort of a Zen background, or at least having invested several years in that, you're mm -hmm. familiar with practice. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's, that's a very practice-oriented tradition. Yeah. Are, are you um, sort of dismissing the value of practice? Yes, mm -hmm. right. Kind of as a universal prescription, you would tell people not to bother with practices of any kind. That's right. If I had to put it that way, I would put it that way. Uh, because, <clears throat> again, as I say, any kind of practice has the idea that there's something that's going to take place in the future as a result, as a consequence of this practice. Mm. And, uh, go ahead. Well, I suppose we can't use uh, the metaphor, or the uh, the comparison between learning to play the piano and, and, and attaining enlightenment, because, I mean, I have the ten fingers necessary to play the piano, but I can't really play one. <laughs> and and if I learned, if I started practicing, the more I practiced, the better I would get at playing one. So perhaps you could distinguish for us the difference between a worldly uh, accomplishment like that mm -hmm. um, and what you're talking about. Yeah, well, it's obvious that uh, but, uh, to be able to sit down and play Chopin isn't something that is available right now. In other words, in order to do that, or as Krishna already often pointed out, to learn a foreign language, you do have to practice that sort of thing. You do have to get involved in something that's going to pay off in the future. Right. And so we apply those same kind of ideas to the idea of awakening. Mm -hmm. But we need not do that. In fact, that's going to create problems. Hmm. What we have to recognize is that there's something that's here now, and that's what we're looking for, and, and it can't be uh, avoided. You can't escape what it is you're looking for. It's here now. Some people would argue that um, the innate ability to play the piano is here in terms of our, our fingers and our brain and whatever it would, but that, that practice is kind of going to develop the capacity to use that ability. And uh, in, 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 by comparison, some would argue that the innate, cer certainly that which we're looking for is here now when we speak of enlightenment, and the innate ability to be living that and to experiencing that is here now, but obviously the vast majority of the seven billion people in the world aren't living it. Mm -hmm. So, and we ask, we, we would have to ask why, and then the question might come, well, because they haven't sort of cultured the um, clarity uh, and perhaps even the neurophysiological functioning to support the clarity that would allow them to recognize that. And that practices could in fact culture the neurophysiology and, and bring about greater clarity uh, so as to make that recognition uh, probable. And in your own case and in Natalie's, you know, there were years of practices and so on leading up to your awakening. Mm -hmm. Well, you could call it a practice, but uh, in, you know, in some cases it may even be practice. But but what it is really is interest in the matter, and what we have is an interest in the matter. Somehow we've we've heard about this subject. Maybe we've read uh, uh, Siddhartha or something like that, and uh, it's inspired us to want to know more uh, about what this uh, matter of enlightenment is all about. And so we start to look into that, and we look at it in various different ways. In other words, we try a number of different ways to, to come to this truth. And, uh, and so we might uh, get involved in some kind of a practice or whatever. Uh, but it isn't the practice that's the key thing. The key thing, the real deep interest in the subject, and, and wanting to really penetrate through to the truth. Uh, when that's present, uh, it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to find your way there, whether you're involved in a practice, whether it's just a matter of reading things, whether it's a matter of talking to people or listening to speakers or whatever, you'll find your way there when the sincerity is 
deeply present. And do you think that people are just sort of spontaneously endowed with that sincere interest, um, uh, just as they might have an interest in, I don't know, whatever we take interest in in life? Uh, or do you think that that interest in itself can be cultured through, uh, through attention, through, um, you know, like yourself, you say you have your attention on this pretty much every day. Uh, and is that just sort of automatic the way Robert Wolf functions or do you feel like you're sort of reinforcing or enhancing or intensifying please leave that on um, your your interest uh, as as you get out of bed every morning and start to write and talk and, and think about this well you know some people are interested in these matters and some people aren't um, Sometimes uh, I will talk with a, like say, a married couple, and one of the partners will be deeply interested in this matter, and the other won't be. I have a friend that I've known all my life. He could care less about this stuff. It just has no interest whatsoever. Yeah. And many of the people I talk with, and, and myself included, this seems to have been a thread that's that's gone through their life from from early on. There's been something about uh, some connection to wanting to comprehend the, the mystery that seems to be behind all this. So for some people uh, it, it's there and for some people it's not. Um, and I, I think that what probably might be an inspiration uh, is uh, what, what one reads uh, or what one hears or better yet, what one sees in the lives of people who are living this life. That's, mm. that's the real inspiration for it. Yeah. It's, a, it's sort of a cart and a horse issue, you know, or chicken and egg. I'm, I'm just kind of curious about, um, you know, are we it's just sort of, some of us are just cut out to be interested in this mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. or, or can we kind of um, culture an interest? Uh, maybe start out with a little spark and through through intention and attention build it into a bonfire if that's going to happen I think it has to happen out of how you live your life yeah um, you know uh, talking about it writing about it uh, may help but uh, you and I know a lot of people who talk about it and write about it uh, and it's questionable whether they're really living it so so the real fact is, uh, the question is, are you living this? And if you are, that's as much uh, of a bonfire as you can build, I think. Mm. Well, that gets back to my earlier point about, you know, you can, you can talk the talk, but mm -hmm. are, you, are you really walking the walk? You know, are you, are you really living it? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, are, and are you mistaking talking the talk for, for walking the walk? That's right. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a subtle issue. I mean, and... Uh, and it, it actually kind of almost leads us into a discussion of free will. I mean, because you're saying, well, it depends on how you live your life. You know, you, you can, if, if you really live your life in such a way as to kindle this interest more and more, then it will become your highest priority. And so, but that very much sounds like a volitional, uh, intentional kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't know. I, I, there's only so much I can say about that. But, mm -hmm. but one of the things you, you come to recognize, I think, uh, with uh, with some time is that um, that there's something operating here, and uh, and we have an idea that, that that there's this me that's doing the operating that's that's uh, in control, and when we see through the uh, this illusion of the me, then we recognize that there is something operating here, and 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 there's something that we really ultimately have no control over. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so all I know is that this unfolds for some people and it doesn't for others. And, uh, and maybe that's part of the mystery. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's something that's of interest to some and not of interest to others. And, and there's not much that can be done about that, I don't think. I don't think you can... You can do anything more than just uh, be living this life that you see as truth and, uh, and hoping that, uh, that whatever uh, positive effect there might be from that is going to 
prevail. Yeah. Um, well, it's, that's an interesting way you phrase that. There's something operating here, and and I think you said at a certain point it feels like it's me who's doing it, mm -hmm. and then you you kind of imply that after, later on maybe it's you realize that you're not really the charioteer you thought yourself to be. Right. Um, right. Well, what is your sense of a, a personal self or lack of such um, now, I suppose, or even for the past 20 years since that awakening? I mean, is there still some semblance of Robert or is there sen so, so no sense of a personal self? And Well, you, you know, one still answers to one's name um, and you still have the memories that you've had all your life. And certain uh, habitual reactions and, and conditioned uh, responses and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something here now that witnesses those things. In other words, there's something here that's aware of what this organism is doing, right. saying, thinking. Um, and sometimes noting some of the peculiarities, uh, some of the habitual responses and so on and so forth. Um, but um, but the sense of, of, you might say, who this is, is more uh, a sense of the witness of what's taking place as opposed yeah. to anything else. In other words, could it, would it be accurate to say that um, your identity is more as that which is the witness than as that which is being witnessed. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. it, whereas, whereas previously you, you were sort of encapsulated within this individuality and you felt, this is me. Yeah. You know, now it's more like the, the me, if you could use that word, is, is a much broader, vaster, so, more silent, more fundamental state or yeah. reality. And, and, but there's still this wave on the ocean that we call Robert. And if, if, mm -hmm. if, that, if that body stubs its toe, the, the, fain, the pain is felt locally. And yes. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and and you know it's not uh, not that the witness and what's being witnessed are two different things. That right. they're seen to be the same. In other words, uh, what's witnessing and what's being witnessed are not seen to be separate. They're seen to be the same. Hmm. Could you uh, go ahead? Do you want to get some water? Is that what you're reaching? No, for? I well, yeah, I'm reaching for it, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, take a sip. Uh, all right. Could you elaborate on that a bit about the um, the 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 witness and the witnessed are seen to be the same. Well, uh, again, uh, I think if you really come from the place where it's clear that there's no separation, no division, that what we're talking about is, is one seamless actuality, uh, then that is how things are perceived. That doesn't mean to say that we can't break things down into individual pieces if we want to. In other words, uh, in order to live in the relative material world, there are certain things we have to do uh, uh, to do that. And, uh, and so we make distinctions and make choices and so on and so forth. But from the standpoint of the, the big picture, the ultimate reality, the recognition is that there's not any separate thing. It's just this one unbroken actuality. And does that big picture tend to be your kind of ordinary everyday um, orientation? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that, that for me is what it means to be living non-duality, to be living right. in that place where, where it's seen that ultimately there's, there's just this one actuality, one. Sure. And I'm sure you don't have to think about it or remind, right. remind yourself no, or anything no. like that. It's just like as natural as breathing. Absolutely. In mm, yeah. fact, you know, once once this awareness becomes uh, settled in, uh, it, it, it's it's as natural as uh, as our dualistic perspective was before. Mm -hmm. Just kind of on ordinary, stable, everyday right. way of living. Right. <clears throat> uh, I understand from Natalie that you have uh, kind of an interest in physics and consciousness. Oh uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm persuaded that if a person did nothing more than really comprehend what physicists are saying these days, they would get the picture of, uh, of non-duality. Mm -hmm. You know, as I said, when I was spending out three years in the forest, one of the things I read was Fritjof Capra's uh, Tao of Physics. Right. And he's 
one of the first physicists who really made connections between what physicists are talking about these days and the uh, Eastern teachings. Um, and it helped me uh, to see this point that has to do with, uh, with no boundaries, with, uh, with uh, nothingness uh, as a reality. Um, in fact, uh, my publisher, Michael Lommel, has a manuscript uh, on his desk right now, which may be the fourth book, which may come out next year, which would be a book on science and uh, non-duality, uh, because I've read uh, maybe a couple of dozen uh, books by physicists uh, who are popularizing these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've... Uh, 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 they're, they're saying a lot of things that the Eastern teachings, uh, Eastern teachings have been saying for thousands of years, and uh, so I've, uh, I've put some of those things together uh, in a book with some of my own commentary. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, uh, I think uh, anyone who uh, wants to get a sense of whether this non-dual uh, actuality is a real thing in terms of the physical world, um, to read about what's going on in quantum physics these days will uh, will help to solidify that. You may be familiar that in non, uh, living non-duality, there's uh, a couple of uh, monographs in there on physics, uh, one of them having to do with uh, what in quantum physics is called entanglement, uh -huh. which uh, is, uh, has blown the minds of physicists uh, uh, for the past uh, couple of decades. Huh. What is that? Well, uh, you want me to go into that? In, 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 in brief, I mean, you know, well, as much as you think is uh, going to be interesting to people. Yeah, well, the thing that you have to recognize is that uh, this is not conjecture. This yeah. is proven scientifically. Right. And what it amounts to is if you take uh, a, a, a decaying uh, atom uh, and it ejects uh, 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 particles uh, which fly off in opposite directions, uh, these are called paired particles because originally they came from the same source, so they're paired. Uh, as a physical fact, uh, if the polarity, we'll say, of one of those particles is changed, uh, the other will consequently change just as a physical fact. And uh, what they found is that when you send these particles off in these opposite directions, if you do change the polarity of one, the other one changes instantly. Now this has to do with something happening at faster than the speed of light. And in our part of the universe, nothing can be communicated faster than the speed of light. So in other words, there's not a message going from one saying, I'm changing my polarity, you should change yours. Mm. This is an instantaneous change, faster than the speed of light. And these particles are far enough apart that from the standpoint of the size of these particles, it could be a universal distance. Yeah. And so actually the word fast. Going on. Yeah. And the word faster probably doesn't even pertain because that implies speed, and we're talking about something which is instantaneous, which is therefore mediated by something that's beyond the realm of, of space and time altogether. That's the point, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's, there, th that indicates that there's some kind of um, intelligence, uh, a, a, a field of intelligence in which these, these uh, particles are operating. But it also tells us that, that these subatomic particles are linked uh, in a way that, as you said, uh, is, is vaster than, than anything that has to do with time and space. And of course, we're made up of some atomic particles. You have them, I have them, and, and the point is that these things are linked. There's a link. I like the fact that you use the word intelligence. Um, why would you use that word? Uh, it has an anthropomorphic quality. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Are you alluding to God, perhaps? Well, I, I often point out when I use the word intelligence that it's something beyond what we think of as intelligence. I mean, you know, it has nothing to do with, with the kind of logic uh, that we think of when we think of intelligence. But, you know, we've got this 
cosmos that uh, is at least uh, about 14 billion years old, and uh, and it's evolved, uh, they say, from uh, something that was smaller than, than a subatomic particle. Uh, and, and what we have is this vast cosmos, just incredibly uh, uh, vast uh, in terms of uh, anything we think of in terms of size. And all this stuff is, is moving around in this thing, and it's all doing what it's doing perfectly well. There's creation, there's destruction, but somehow there's some kind of balance and harmony in all of that. Uh, it, it's not chaotic. It doesn't just all collapse. Right. So there's something that's going on here that's pretty goddamn intelligent. <laughs> I agree. I mean, it's like you could almost think of it as laws of nature, but they're not in kind of dumb laws. They're not inanimate laws. There's mm -hmm. at every single level. I mean, the biological level. There's laws that are governing all the functions in our bodies, and and you know, and then it, break it down to the molecular level. And there's laws that are governing the molecules. Exactly. Take it, down, take it down to the atomic, and there's that. And, exactly. And, and at every level, it's awe-inspiring and jaw-dropping <laughs> when you consider the the the, the mystery of, of how everything's operating at every level and mm -hmm. that to me is that's my concept of God you know it's not not some guy with a beard up in the sky but just this intelligence that seems to be governing everything from the microscopic to the macroscopic in a, in a completely awe-inspiring degree of uh, you know sophistication and beauty and complexity you summed it up because that's that's just what these physicists are saying who are looking at it now like, yeah. they're making those connections and uh, and that also, to me, gives leads me to the conclusion that in in a spiritual sense, there is a vast range of development possible, mm -hmm. uh, because I don't see any end to the appreciation, which is the word you used earlier, of that intelligence, mm -hmm. the the degree, the the refinement with which that can be appreciated. Yeah. 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 So, and uh, don't let me put words in your mouth, I mean, uh, but, you know, when I hear people say, um, well, I had this awakening and I'm done, uh, I think, great, but, you know, it could be that that's the foundation for mm -hmm. a, a wonderful um, journey that you'll yeah. continue to go on, ex mm -hmm. in, uh, developing in your appreciation of this yep. mar marvelous creation. And <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it it really brings you present with what's present. Uh, you know, before we're so distracted uh, with all of our ideas and concepts and fears and beliefs and so on and so forth. When all that's out of the way and you're immediately in contact with what's present, it's 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 really something to be grateful for, be appreciative. Yeah, it really is. Um in fact, I forget the word you used a little earlier, you, 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 you were, but I got the impression of, you know, we as human beings almost being like sort of instruments of the divine or something, or uh, it's mm -hmm. not, the word, not the word you used, but mm -hmm. it, it's like there was a, a vaster force or a deeper uh, reality, and we're just kind of like, you know, sense organs of that, <laughs> in a way. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I think an ancient... Uh, in the ancient uh, scriptures, basically, that's what they're saying. They're saying that uh, that we're here to uh, to reify the absolute. In other words, we're here to make the absolute a, a, a reality. Because if we weren't here, it, it would just be something that isn't isn't reified. It's not seen to be what it is, and that's our role to see yeah. it for what it is, and that makes it real. And is that what the word reify means? To make real? I, I was, yeah. Oh, okay. And to make it a living reality. I mean, if we are that ultimately, yeah. then why do we exist as human beings? It, it, perhaps could it, could we suggest that that wants to sort of ex live through? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> these yeah. instrumental this, this instrument, you know. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, that without without some uh, you might say intelligent consciousness to to uh, relate to what this is, then it basically th it doesn't exist. 
it exists to the extent that we recognize its existence. So that would be our role. That's yeah. what these teachings are saying, the ancient scriptures. That's beautiful. And uh, and could we say that maybe, um, well, I think we've kind of said it, but that, again, it bears re repeating that if, if that wants to live it, uh, uh, fully through this human nervous system and to know itself and mm -hmm. and to express itself then there's no end to the uh profundity of that expression or the clarity of that living it, it's a it's a lifelong adventure yeah and of course it tells us too that 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 everything and everybody is doing that exactly know? yeah whether you're enlightened or not you're an expression of that and all yeah. this is an expression yeah, I mean, if you're going to take that perspective, then you have to say that the people starving in Africa and the, the cats and the dogs and the birds and the, the slaughterhouses and, and you know, all the beauty and all the horror and everything right. is, is part of the whole sh show. That's it. You know, as the comparisons often made between Hitler and Mother Teresa, it's all the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Well, we're sort of philosophizing a bit here, but I, I sort of think, you know, you can... You can tie this stuff back to experience. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I would, would you see, it's not just conjecture. You know, there, there's mm -hmm. a kind of a experiential verification of it somehow. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and personally, I feel, I feel it's helpful to have these discussions because mm -hmm. it, um, just, it, it kind of breaks you out of calcified ways of seeing and thinking. You know, you can, you can get narrow, um, Mm -hmm. And it it can kind of, you know, you you can sort of become polarized into this perspective or that, and if you you kind of stretch it out a bit <laughs> and uh, encompass the whole range. Well, one of the reasons why I I started this uh, discussion group uh, is because in speaking with people and coming across people like Natalie who who clearly have awakened to this truth. Uh, this discussion gives them an opportunity to express what they're seeing, how they're seeing it, how it's unfolding for them, mm -hmm. and also to recognize that this, this is taking place for others, too, in pretty much the same way. There may be a little difference here, a little difference there, but it's an opportunity to, to, uh, to, to see that, yes, this is what I'm seeing, and yes, other people are seeing this, and, and express it. Yeah. And uh, and like you said earlier, it helps. It clarifies your own understanding to Absolutely. do that, to, to do that expression and to yeah. write. For, That's I right. have a friend who uh, had his awakening when he was a teenager, and now he's older than I am. He's in his mid sixties, and he spends like an hour, at least an hour a day, just writing. Mm -hmm. uh, and he doesn't have any des desire to publish it or to be interviewed or anything else. He lives a private life, but he says it just uh, it's a, it's a, s a method of exploration for him Absolutely. and. Uh, continuing clarification of his understanding and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, those monographs that are in Living Non-Duality have been written over a period of 20-some years. Um, and uh, some of them were written in response to a question somebody raised or like if I'm corresponding with a prison inmate or something, uh, answering something that arises in his life. Uh, but some of them were written just uh, because I wanted to make sure that what I was seeing was clear. And if you put something down in writing, you have to be clear. There can't be fuzzy thinking there. So, so it's yeah. not written for my own benefit to, to make sure that what I'm seeing is, is truth and not some kind of a, not some kind of a non sequitur. Uh, so I, I do, uh, I encourage people after their awakening to go back and reread uh, the the enlightened masters because the first time around when you're reading it and you don't understand it uh, it's one thing when you go back and reread it now that you understand what they're talking about it's a whole different thing <laughs> yeah. so I, I I recommend people continue to read these things uh, to write about it and to speak about it mm, yeah and uh, and again I, I I found in your book a great degree of clarity and. Uh, you know, I really think you accomplished what your purpose was in writing this stuff. It um, it really hits home, goes very deep, and. Um, Have you seen my second book? No, this is the only one I've seen. Natalie sent me this. Okay, well, well the second the second one is uh, the title is uh, the Gospel of Thomas, the Enlightenment Teachings of Jesus. Oh. Um, and uh, in that 
I had an opportunity uh, to again summarize uh, what seemed to me to be the uh, these teachings. So you might want to look at that one too. Um, and I, I should also mention that uh, uh, Natalie has uh, uh, set up a blog site where she writes some monographs of her own. Uh, and another man who came to see me, Ron Bonilla, B-O-M-I-L-L-A, he's, he's done the same. So uh, so these are ways that uh, the word gets out, I think, and, and yeah. uh, maybe, maybe introduces some people to the subject. Uh, you know, things like uh, Eckhart Tolle's book, uh, you know, some woman out in Iowa who maybe never heard of non-duality picks up a book like Eckhart Tolle's that talks about, you know, being in the now or whatever, mm -hmm. and becomes interested in what is this matter of non-duality? What are they talking about here? And so there's interest that develops. You can see it all the time. Your program's a good example of what's, what's going on in that regard. Oh yeah, it's it, the whole thing is just getting not only my program but this whole field is just I think getting more and more into the popular culture. Absolutely, it's 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 doing what Zen did 30 or 40 years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, you might like that conference, the the Science and Non-Duality Conference. I'm familiar they, with. Mm -hmm. I went to it this year and I heard a, heard a couple of physicists speak, John Hagelin and Fred Allen Wolf, your, your uh -huh. namesake, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, it was very inspiring and enlivening. Mm -hmm. Good, great stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Well, I think uh, we've pretty much covered it for now. Do mm -hmm. um, you know? I, I get a lot of feedback from people, and I get a lot of constructive criticism. The main point being, you know, that I people say I talk too much. So I, mm -hmm. I just want to apologize to mm -hmm. those people, to you, to anybody else, because I know I'm guilty of it sometimes. I, I run oh. off at the mouth. <laughs> no, I, I'd actually say you're the best interviewer I've talked to so far. Oh, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you know what it is is uh, is like sometimes I'm f I f I'm feeling really settled and intuitive and and it just flows and I and there's a right proportion. Other times I I sort of get feeling the shakti, you know, and I I get way it's like I've had a cup of coffee or something. I get way too way too talkative. Well, I, I I have a sense you know what we're talking about. Yeah, that yeah, makes I've, a difference. I've been on this quest or path myself since the '60s. And yeah. yeah. In yeah. fact, I may have met, met one of those Roshis that you referred to. I went into Manhattan when I was 18 years old and oh. went to a Zen center, and there was this Japanese man with a shaved uh -huh. head, uh -huh. Roshi, and we went through a little routine mm -hmm. and talk and, and so on. And right. yeah. In fact, I remember he went around the room and asked everybody why they were there, what they were interested in, and um, and I just said, uh, you know, I'm interested in truth. You know, I yeah. want truth. He liked that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Uh, yeah. So it's been a long, long travel for you too, then. It has, but a very enjoyable one, and, and it con continues to be. It's just, um, it's a joy. Well, I, I'm, I appreciate what you're doing. Yeah, thanks, and uh, and likewise. Um, so, uh, let me uh, conclude then. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to once again thank Robert Wolf for being my guest today. Um, Robert lives in Ojai, but now that he's no longer a Skype newbie, he could even perhaps carry on some conversations, you know, face to face with people. Since you like to do face to face talks, Skype is a good way of doing that. They don't have to be in Ojai. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, and um, and of course you've written three books now, um, which I will link to from my website. Great. Thank you. And um, and you also, I believe, have a website. In, yeah. 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 It's okay. livingnonduality.org. Good, so I'll link to that too. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those who've been listening or watching, um, this is an uh, ongoing series, as we've been sort of indicating. Um, I think this was maybe the 99th interview. <laughs> really? Mm. <laughs> so ne next week is the big 100. Uh, mm. And every week I do a new one, one a week. If if you'd like to be um, notified whenever a new one is posted, you can, and if also to see what what all the other ones are, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, which is an acronym for Buddha at the Gas Pump. There also you'll find a link to a podcast, so you can subscribe to this and get it on your iPod or iPhone, listen while you're commuting. Uh, also, a little discussion group springs up there around every interview, uh, and usually like 20, 30, 40, sometimes over 100 comments are posted uh, mm. as people discuss what has been discussed in the interview. Mm. So feel free to come and participate in that. Um, 
There's a donate button there, which you can click on if you wish, which helps to defray the expenses of, of this in terms of uh, you know software, hardware, went going to that conference I mentioned, and so on. Mm -hmm. But obviously no obligation to do that. Mm. So uh, thank you, everyone, for listening or watching. Thank you again, Robert. My pleasure. Uh, thanks again to Natalie, who, who mm -hmm. set this up. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you.